Forbidden City. For five centuries, the private home of the emperors of China. Today, it's a museum. Yet few visitors ever suspect that in a corner far away from the crowds lies an extraordinary, long dormant secret. It was an emperor's private lodge, closed to outsiders for 200 years. But its slumber was about to end. The Palace Museum was ready to begin the restoration of one of its greatest treasures. For this ambitious project, the Palace Museum selected as their partners the World Monuments Fund. When their representative, John Stubbs, was first invited to the lodge, he was overwhelmed. And my eyes adjusted to the darkness, and I saw the most fantastic architectural features I've ever seen in my life. I could see that this was something of the greatest historic and art artistic significance, and was just speechless. Despite the dirt and decay, the quality of the rooms shone through. Everything was distinctive, different. This was something altogether unique and precious. The tour led me to the most magnificent room of all, which happened to have these all important trompe l'oeil paintings on the walls. I sensed in a second that I was touching highly important Chinese history firsthand. This visit marked the beginning of a remarkable mission by an international team of experts to restore the Emperor's Lodge to its full glory. It's a journey into a forgotten world where only the finest craftsmanship could be offered to an emperor. A visionary emperor whose genius created this, the final flowering of his life's work. In 1736, a young Qing prince of the last imperial dynasty was crowned emperor of China. Aged just 25, Emperor Qian Long found himself absolute ruler of 250 million people in a country whose borders were greater than those of China today. In the Forbidden City, symbolic heart of the empire and the largest palace ever built, the young Qianlong took over the reins of a flourishing empire. Under his rule, China reached a new peak of power and wealth. The success of his reign made him the richest man on earth. Whatever he wanted was his. And what he wanted was art, carving, sculpture, painting, all that was finest. His taste was impeccable, his standards the highest. Many of the finest artworks in the Forbidden City were created during his reign. His ambition to collect was a huge cultural project in the uh, 18th century. He collected from all sources and he also brought craftsmen from the south to work in the palace. There was an office specifically for the manufacture of luxury goods for the emperor. To portray an image of a cosmopolitan court, Chen Long collected European art and was fascinated by Western artifacts, especially clocks.
The ticking of hundreds of clocks echoed through every hall in the Forbidden City. Some were made in his own workshops, others were gifts from Europe. Intricate, imaginative, all were works of art. This one, the biggest in the imperial city at over two meters high, was Qianlong's favorite. The calligrapher, at its base, endlessly writes, His Majesty's influence reaches in all directions. Out of reverence for his grandfather, Chen Long made a solemn undertaking. As the years brought him nearer to his intended retirement, Chen Long ordered the construction of a private retreat. was to be quite different to the monumental style of the Forbidden City. The private oasis he planned for his retirement was small and intimate, a distillation of all he loved and admired. Chen Long's new home, hidden in the northeast corner of the Forbidden City, was a small complex of pavilions within a garden planted with the trees and flowers of his favorite southern landscapes, each with its own symbolic significance. In 呃，这个抗严寒，熬风雪，它的一种挺拔坚毅坚定的这个这种性格。The the buildings are arranged around small courtyards. In the far corner of the garden is the jewel of the complex, an exquisite, totally unique lodge. The nameplate reads Wan Chin Jai, which literally translated means the studio of exhaustion from diligent service. After a lifetime ruling China, Qian Long was looking forward to a restful, idyllic old age. So his Chen Chin Jai's construction has the most beautiful work and the most beautiful materials in there. It's laid out as it's really an enfilade of rooms that ends with a, a completely spectacular space that we call the theater room, which happened to have these all important trompe l'oeil paintings. These paintings were special because trompe l'oeil, the art of creating an illusion of three dimensions, was a Western device completely foreign to traditional Chinese art. It is the only big ensemble of illusionist painting which is surviving now. It is a masterpiece of illusionist art. 
Chen Long was introduced to the techniques of Western painting by a Jesuit artist, Giuseppe Castiglione, who'd risen high in the imperial court. Many of his paintings from this period have survived. He became a master in the painting studio, and he did produce the most magnificent, really amazing paintings for the Qianlong Emperor. Castellan was an extraordinary man, very gentle, very modest. He stayed in China in the hope to serve God and in the hope to convert the emperor and through the emperor to convert China. Castiglione's portraits of Chen Long helped create an image of a successful and multifaceted ruler. He also introduced Chen Long to a new vision of space, fusing the art of East and West in a completely radical way. Even in the darkness, one could see it's organized around one point perspective, which is the opposite of Chinese artistic conception. So I could see in a minute it was hyper special. By 2002, preparations were finally in place. Wang Shirwei of the Palace Museum led a team of experts dedicated to the restoration of Wan Xinjai. Aware of growing public interest in protecting China's cultural heritage, the Palace Museum was determined to maintain the highest standards of conservation. To this end, an international team of specialists was assembled in Beijing. They included architects, engineers, scientists, artists, historians, and archaeologists. Word of the project began to spread. In New York, painting restorer T.K. McClintock first read about it in a newspaper. Soon after, TK was invited to join the Palace Museum conservation team. Their first task was to remove the delicate silk paintings from the ceiling so that they could be cleaned and restored. I'd worked on many big projects, but I'd not worked in China before. So it was a terrific opportunity. It's one of the great schools of conservation. Early attempts to remove the murals by moistening the edges had been unsuccessful. Their only hope of getting the murals down in one piece was to remove them dry. We began going in underneath the murals with spatulas and slipping a spatula in between the layers and shaving off the layer of paper adhered to the back of the mural. That was not always as safe as we would have liked so we had to take the whole sandwich of materials down. There were 12 large panels for the team to remove. The operation was made easier by the strong and resilient backing on which the murals were mounted. But still, it was a tricky, nail-biting process. But it looks pretty out of control, but in fact, it was actually pretty in control. <laughs> Good job. Good job, everybody. Good job. By the end of 2003, the precious murals had been safely removed and taken to a specially built conservation studio. There, the team were ready to begin the next stage of this meticulous, painstaking process. Elsewhere in the lodge, the process of sorting the remains of Qin Long's vision had begun. Centuries of accumulated grime was patiently removed. Mm -hmm. 
the scale of the task ahead was now clear. The process of restoring Qianlong's masterpiece was to last years and demand the highest levels of knowledge and dedication. The experts of the Palace Museum, with their many years of experience safeguarding the heritage of the Forbidden City, were equal to the challenge. The project was to forge new links of cooperation between the restoration experts of the Palace Museum and their Western guests. The challenge at a place like the Lodge was not only to restore the room, but to work with the Palace Museum to develop an approach that really met international standards on how you restore a building that has materials and craftsmanship that no longer exist. The Palace Museum's research led them to the southern province of Jiangnan, where Qian Long had once ordered his finest silk commissions. In the ancient city of Suzhou, they finally found their answer. Gu Wenxia's skill had introduced her to many famous people, from King Sihanouk to American President Jimmy Carter. Gu Wenxia had carried on the tradition, teaching her craft to new generations of embroiderers. Now they'd have to match their ancestors' skills to recreate the embroidered furnishings inside Chen Long's lodge. Gu Wanxia's son and daughter-in-law, Jan Ping, now run the family workshop. The craft of embroidery reached its peak under Chen Long in the mid-18th century. It began here around the waterways of Suzhou and derived from the tattoos of local fishermen. Uh the surviving Zhuan Qinjai embroideries were in poor condition, so the workshop had to make do with photographs to recreate the designs. <laughs> It's 
几百年前的文物，现在是已经是保存在故宫里面，他不让带出宫的，就增加了一个难度。Using these photographs, Gu Wanxia's son and his wife meticulously trace the ancient patterns, first onto paper, then onto the delicate silk ready to be embroidered. 我和徐老师呢，主要就是负责就是把白描的空心稿。给它勾在勾勒在那个明黄鹅黄的拱蛋上面。These finely detailed embroideries will eventually be made up into ornamental cushions for the lodge. Only Gu Wun Sha's most experienced embroiderers were entrusted with the work. More than thirty of them worked for a year to finish twenty-three exquisite pieces. Next in the conservation team's search was brocade, one of China's most ancient arts. Actually, our brocade in the Han Dynasty was quite advanced. So, in the past, this trade was quite advanced in the Nanjing. The most advanced in the Qing period was to reach 3,000 brocade, or even to reach 5,000 brocade. If you were to reach the Nanjing, you would reach the Nanjing Mountain, 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 it was to the old imperial capital of Nanjing that the restoration team went in search of a workshop able to replicate the lost brocade furnishings in Zhuanqingjai. Of all the fabrics in Qianlong's lodge, the brocade is the most difficult. The fabric is woven on looms in designs of daunting complexity. The skills for this craft were once handed down from father to son. My name is Zhang. My name is Zhang Kaizhen. We are a family of nine years old. My real family is in 明代的四里间神宝堂里面从事这项工作。我的祖父、曾祖父，他们是在江宁织造府，叫清代江宁织造府，从事这个设计雕花工作。我的父亲跟我呢，都是在南京一直在从事这个行业。到我这到我这目前为止呢，我已经从事了四十多年的这个工作行这个行业的工作。Mr. Zhang's factory makes modern brocade, but he and his team agreed to take on the challenge of recreating Zhuanqin Jai's ancient, more complex fabrics. They use looms based on Qing dynasty designs. At first, all went smoothly. The weaver at the bottom is responsible for selecting the colors within the fabric, while the person at the top creates the brocade's patterns. In her office in the Forbidden City, conservator Mrs. Yuan is examining brocades arriving from Nanjing. She's responsible for the quality of all the fabrics in the restoration of Zhuanqinjai. By 2006, three out of the four different brocades had been mastered. One, however, remained elusive, the rare Zhuanghua velvet. 这种金彩绒呢，在我们国家失传了一百多年，这是故宫里头唯一的一块呢一级品的这个金彩绒。The brocade team also had to rely mainly on old photographs, which hadn't helped much with the velvet. 但是经历了许多许多的困难，可能嗯、呃、有上百次，他们做了上百次的试验。而真正的妆花绒呢，它是比较
，有有逆光效果的，它是这种形形状，它是这种形状。Not only was the velvet texture a struggle, the colors were a major challenge too. 这一块就是我们早期试制的，那么这一块试制呢，色彩不好。就是它以原样的色彩呢，这个是发金黄色，那么就是这颜色上面我们失败了。As the brocade factory went back to the drawing board, work was progressing on the murals inside the Forbidden City. The work on the Trompe l'oeil murals was going well. The team was already on the second panel, gently cleaning the surface with the traditional wheat dough. The pigments were then fixed with gelatin and seaweed adhesives to protect the colors. Before the old backing papers could be removed, layers of rayon paper were applied to further protect the mural. Removing the old backing was a tense process. The moisture weakens the paintings to a dangerous degree. Now the paper that had protected and supported the painting for more than two centuries had to be carefully removed. This vital ingredient, key to the mural's survival, was a paper made from mulberry bark and known as song pea. In this song pea paper, fibers are much longer, therefore the paper is much more robust, much stronger, and this is what was needed for such large sections. And that was one of the unusual materials that had to be sourced for the conservation project. Finding a source of shang -Pi paper was one of the project's biggest challenges. In 2004, the restoration team traveled to the mountainous province of Anhui, where papermaking had been a tradition for centuries. Now it's a dying art as most people here have turned to a more profitable way of making a living, quarrying local stone. The team found one man, the last in his village, still making paper in the traditional way. While most of his village are busy with the harvest, Yui Fu has agreed to try and reproduce the long-lost mulberry paper that is needed to back the restored murals. Well, 我叫于富，我是安徽省潜深县土里宣纸厂的厂长。我们这造纸工艺是从老祖宗两百多年以前传下来的，是从我的记事是从我爷爷到我父亲手上，到我到初中毕业，一直就干这个。In a workshop built by his ancestors, Yui Fu and his family make paper for the conservation of antique books. The Palace Museum was interested in using this paper both for its inherent qualities but also because it was the historical material that was used. And that was a, a really terrific part of the project and an unusual part of it. The best mulberry bark can only be harvested once a year in spring from high in the mountains above the village. Yui Fu knew that his paper is destined to line irreplaceable works of art, and that only the highest standards would be good enough. Back in the studio, Yui Fu's first attempts were rejected. Improving the quality involved arduously repeated processes of boiling, bleaching, and rinsing to make the paper more refined. After a whole year of trial and error, Yui Fu finally got the conservation team's approval. They had made Sang Pi paper even better than the original. For a humble rural workshop, it was a major achievement. 
Finally, the Mulberry Bark paper went up on the lodge's walls. Yui Fu's paper would protect the murals for many years to come. It was Palace Museum curator Cao Jing Lo who had found paper maker Yui Fu. Now he was looking for an even rarer craft, that of inner skin bamboo marquetry. It had been used extensively in Zhuanqinjai, and it had suffered badly during the centuries of neglect. Bamboo crafts traditionally came from the province of Zhejiang. Don Yang was the first place searched for these surviving skills. Mr. Cao traveled there with the restoration team. He'd placed ads in the local newspapers asking craftsmen to contact him. Her Fu Li's business is making high quality bamboo pieces. We found at that time the last vestiges of the talent in all of China still making a certain kind of inner bamboo skin marquetry inlay which no one knew anything about. But Her Fu Li was practicing this rare and difficult craft for the modern commercial market, a style far removed from the work in Chen Long's lodge. Chen Long greatly admired the bamboo marketry skills of southern craftsmen and used their work liberally in the Forbidden City. By 2006, Her Fu Li was preparing the inner skin of the bamboo to take to the Forbidden City. This is what was used to make the marquetry in Zhuanqinjai. The flattened inner skin is cut into strips and woven into intricate geometric patterns, which Chen Long had inlaid with jade. The skills of this craft are all but lost in China today, but they're still alive in Mr. He's workshop. In 2008, T.K. McClintock was back in Beijing, and the conservation team was nearing the end of its work. At last, the mural was ready for the final challenge, getting the panel safely back into place. To help them prepare, the Palace Museum had created a scale model of the theater room. The remounting was the most difficult part of the paintings conservation project. The uncertainties that existed were largely, can we take these huge sections and in particular get the first ones up so that the other ones will fall correctly. The team decided to first lay the ceiling panels out in their correct order on the floor, as accuracy was paramount. Uh, okay. 
we had a lot of discussions about the actual choreography of getting the paintings onto the ceiling. Judging the precise amount of glue was crucial. The task of getting the huge painting safely up to the ceiling posed another major challenge. We just didn't have that much room in which to maneuver, so we decided to do it by rolling them up and unrolling them using guidelines that we had. There were 12 ceiling sections. The first one was a little hairy. We have a certain window of opportunity where the adhesive is active to accept the mural and to have that bond form. For such a huge project, uh, there were no disasters. No, 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 no. The Trompe l'oeil paintings echoing the pavilions outside was the last to be remounted. But this unique work raises an unsolved mystery about all the murals. Who painted them? One scholar who's devoted her life to the study of Castiglione has an intriguing theory. When Chantindrai was built, Castiglione was already dead. But after Castiglione, there were no more good Western painters at the court. And so I think this trompe painting could be the work of Castiglione, helped by Chinese artist. The dimensions of Zhuan Qinzhai are identical to a pavilion that Chen Long had created earlier. It had been decorated with Castiglione trompe l'oeil murals, works that later disappeared. Could those murals have been transferred to Zhuan Qinzhai so the emperor could continue to enjoy them, even in retirement? The archive says mentioned that in 1742, Qianlong Emperor ordered Castiglione to paint in a pavilion, a Visteria Pergola. And as Tian Jindrai was built as a copy of this pavilion, it is very possible that the paintings were replaced in the new building. The style, the technique, even the brush strokes are exactly in the Castilian style. A crane that Castiglione is known to have painted is a mirror image of the bird in the mural in Zhuan Xinjai. The cranes he painted during the Yongzheng reign, it is nearly the same. It is exactly the same style. By 2007, the Nanjing factory was still grappling with the Zhuanghua velvet. Though daunted by their task, they persevered, scouring the history books in search of lost techniques. Dai Jian spent two years designing machinery to make the special velvet. Attached to the loom, he created an ingenious system of weights to regulate the density of the brocade. One thousand eight hundred tiny handmade clay and ceramic weights hung on strings control the silk's tension via thousands of bobbins. Creating this machine reduced the number of loom operators required and proved to be the start of a long road to success. This piece of velvet brocade was woven with thousands of thin wires. 
Once cut away, they left behind a raised velvet pile. So this 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 is the experiment. Is after two years. So each time each time, the machine is going forward. The design is also going forward. So we have great faith in them. So we have great faith in them. A special knife was made to cut the thin wires out, allowing the delicate pattern covered by them to emerge. Against the odds and over many years, the factory finally produced a batch of Zhuanghua velvet that equaled anything in Zhuanqingjai. We've been through many tests. This is the result of the test. 现在呢，可以告诉大家一个好消息，终于把云锦、宋锦和呃金和呃张荣融合在一起，复制成了金彩绒，这是非常难的一个事情。With the end of their project approaching. The embroidery team worked into the night to pack the finished work for its journey to Beijing. The finished pieces are a revelation. Every element of the design, from the colors to the detail, is symbolic. These peaches represent longevity. The five-clawed dragon was the emperor's personal symbol. Anyone else caught using it would be put to death. By 2008, 260 newly hand-embroidered double-sided screens had been installed in Zhuanqianjai. The work of another southern Chinese embroidery team, they'd taken two years to complete. Yuan Hongqi took their creator, Shun Yinghua, to see them. 因为那里面的色彩啊、格局布局啊，都挺漂亮的，复古如古的感觉吧，里啊，就是我觉得很自豪，能参与进去，就是这种物质文化遗产嘛。By late 2008. He Fu Li, his family, and his best craftsmen had also come to Beijing to work on site in Zhuanqianjai. I also went to Zhuanqianjai. Then I went to Zhuanqianjai. I saw it was a little bit strange. It was like it was about 240 years ago. It was very beautiful. Her Fuli's task was considerable. The bamboo filaments on the stage in the theatre room had all fallen out and needed replacing. There was bamboo in the carved friezes of birds and deer, too. Her Fuli's son and a master woodcarver used all their skills to restore these panels. Damaged marquetry pieces were replaced with new ones, while hundreds of pieces of wood were painted to recreate the faux bamboo latticework. Now, this huge and challenging task is finally complete. As many years of work come to a close, 
Papermaker Yu Yi Fu is traveling from his remote mountain home to see his paper finally in place. For him, it's a first look at the Forbidden City. Brocade makers Chiang Kai Cheng and Chun Rong Xiang are off to Beijing eager to see their finished work in its new home. Uh 那跟我们小乡绅，那简直是天壤地别了。The first to see the lodge, a privilege once reserved solely for the emperor are the brocade workers. Nine generations of Mr. Zhang's family designed brocade for China's emperors, including Qianlong. Nanger 我心里受不住的激动 Mr. Yu can only imagine his paper, which is now hidden from sight behind the murals.
回去采树皮的时候，那山上有那东西，就那个那个那个迎客松那样的东西，画的跟自然的差不多。我们复制的太值得了。Six years after the restoration began, a building that was once created for the private use of an emperor is almost ready to be thrown open to the world. 那八九月份，这个都完了以后，那肯定要达到当年乾隆那个他所需求的那种环境。就是对这个镇清寨的装修呢，确实倾注了很大的心血。他甚至呢是呃，对一个隔扇、一个绣片或者是一个一一件摆设，他都是呃，在档案里面都有详细的记载。Chen Long had created his perfect environment, a luxurious, art-filled retreat far from the pressures of power. Yet the retreat was more of an idea than a reality. The Emperor Qian Long never spent a single night in his lovingly created lodge. He remained in the palace he'd lived in as an emperor, continuing to rule from behind the scenes. When he finally died in 1799 at the age of 88, a great era of art's patronage that culminated with the Qianlong Gardens ended with him. I think the whole Qianlong Garden is a masterpiece because it's a fully executed work which comes from one mind and it's the Qianlong Emperor's mind. But的装修的我们过去不是没有搞过，但是整体的，包括这么高难度的来做的，这是第一个。我个人感觉到它好像皇冠上的明珠一样，它这个建筑在怎么讲，它是当时乾隆这个盛世都一个杰作，应该是它